Hello, and welcome to our fifth and final video segment for our week six lecture on social structure theories. This is based upon the third edition of Frank Smallager's book, Criminology, from Pearson Education. So where we left off, we were looking at cultural conflict theories. We looked at such things as focal concerns. We looked at you know, the differences between cultures and how they might clash within the larger culture, whether it's people moving in from some foreign lands, you know, immigrant cultures in, in large, large numbers in certain areas, and then, you know, having issues with uh, other members of the society. You know, we can see this in our country in a variety of different ways. We mentioned the, the, tran the zone of transition where you have uh, people moving in from various countries who are just starting out. You know, they, they go into the so-called zone of transition within an inner city because the, the housing is, might be cheaper. You know, they can get jobs in, the, say, the service sector or what have you. And then as they uh, do better for themselves and maybe work their ways up, they move out in the, through the rings, as you saw in that uh, concentric zone theory. But you have clashes of cultures because you may have two different cultures at the same time, or maybe more, living in close proximity to one another. So the various differences are gonna, are gonna cause some problems. Look at communities, whether it be here in the United States or in, in England or in France or whatever, where you have uh, various refugee cult cultures, you have cultural issues based upon religion and ethnicity and where they're not getting along with the communities that, are, that were already in place and you have the people moving in. We talked about all of that a little bit. Talked about reaction formation with basically somebody rejecting uh, something or re rejecting middle class values because they don't feel they have the ability to get to them and the code of the street. So now, and remember the code of the street, for those of you that are in Philly or in this area, I grew up in Germantown as a kid, was actually a study that was done in Germantown Avenue area in Germantown in the city of Philadelphia. So it might be very interesting to read. Philadelphia has been the subject of of a few studies in criminology over the years. Uh, more recently, there was one done, one done by another, I believe another University of Pennsylvania scientist who actually lived in the Kensington section of Philadelphia and studied the, uh, the neighborhood there. I'll look that one up, see if I can share it for you because uh, that was, was mentioned in the newspaper a few years ago. I'm not sure if it's still going on, if they actually did their final report, but I would imagine it'd be very interesting considering it right now all of the issues going on with the, the drug culture in the Kensington area. There could be another subculture. That there's a drug subculture of these people that are coming in from all over the country. Uh, well, not necessarily all over the country, but all over the region. But I've heard of people coming as far down as from New York just so they can score drugs right here in Philadelphia because they're more pure. And it's, that's a different cultural phenomenon. It's clashing with the community that's already there. So that could be also a, an example of, of, of culture conflict. Uh, but moving right along, we also talked about the critiques, which, of course, you can read all that from that last lecture. Or go back and watch that last lecture. I'm not going to redo the whole thing, uh, but it's in, obviously in the book. So this section, this is the final section for this uh, week six material. Remember, we have one more week, so we'll be next week addressing uh, social policy, um, social process, excuse me, social process, you know, the interaction of the various social groups and how that might contribute to crime. And there are, there are still several other uh, very interesting chapters within your book that if you have the time, you should look at. Uh, I may create at least one or more other uh, lecture videos on those topics because uh, they are very interesting because the, the, the latter part of the book starts looking at specific types of crime and what are the typologies, what are the things that that lead people to do specifically murders or burglar or rape or whatever. So we look more specifically in the last part of the book at those specific types of crimes. So it's, it's definitely worth looking at. Uh, the PowerPoints are all available for you. If you uh, wanna discuss any of those issues, I'll be more than happy to do that with you. Just not uh, within the purview of this particular course to, to cover all that material. 
So what we're going to get into right now is the policy implications of all these sociological theories that we've talked about so far. You know, by policy implications, remember, what that basically means is how do we use what we know now, like with regard to various cultural groups clashing with each other, or with regard to, you know, how, how rundown neighborhoods might contribute to crime, how do we take that information that we have and make positive changes to our society long term? And, you know, your book suggests some, talks about some projects like the Chicago Area Project and, and mobilization for youth, uh, war on poverty, and all these things occurred many years ago. But let's think more about, you know, what do we do today? And some of these things are, are obviously useful. You know, if the social structure in your society, in your community, where people aren't able to get jobs or education is bad, uh, we might want to find ways to help them. If your neighborhood's looking bad, you know, you want to come up with ways to do that. The Chicago area project basically had three objectives was improving the physical appearance of poorer neighborhoods, providing recreational opportunity for youth and involving project members directly and involved with trouble youth through school and courtroom mediation. Sounds like something we could be doing today, and in some places we are doing today, so, because some of the things that we do, like say in the city, we have the uh, art mural project within the city of Philadelphia, and there's also a graffiti project. Those two actually kind of work in tandem with each other, because the graffiti, anti-graffiti project is basically, you know, people put up graffiti on buildings, and there's people that go around the city and, and clean it up kind of goes in tandem with the, the broken windows theory idea of if you keep the main keep the area well maintained you're going to have less crime people are going to feel more comfortable if they're walking through a clean neighborhood as opposed to a filthy neighborhood and you know crime's going to go down that's what studies have shown and uh, to some degree it really does work so you have the uh, anti-graffiti taking down the graffiti or painting over the graffiti and you have the art mural project, which is then going the next step and taking maybe some of these huge blank walls that exist that kind of draw in the graffiti artists. Because the anti-graffiti project, you got a big blank wall, you can go in and clean it up and then, you know, a day later, somebody's coming in and, and doing it all over again. But then if you go in with the art mural project and you put up this beautiful mural, whether it's a, a memorial to someone from the community that died, memorial like they have in some of the police districts of officers killed in the line of duty. You know, there was one just recently to, to honor two officers in, in the 18th district in Philadelphia that were killed in the last few years. You know, those things cover over those big blank walls and they, they kind of garner more respect from the community. It's less likely that somebody's going to go and tag, uh, tag a mural than they would tag a blank wall. Not that it, not that it never happens because it does happen, but it's less likely. And you know, people can go in and they're going to go in and clean it up right away. So that's another thing you think about, uh, go back to New York city in the eighties with uh, Rudy Giuliani and uh, Bill Bratton, uh, more like the, the mid nineties. And one of the things that they did, and maybe even prior to that, because Bratton actually was in the, uh, the transit police before he was New York city police commissioner was they made a big deal out of cleaning the graffiti off of the train cars in the New York city transit system. And it made people feel better. It made, the system looked better, made people more likely to use the system because they did, because people just had a general feeling of, un, of, of being uncomfortable when they got in with train, it was tagged with all this, all this gang logos and other kind of stuff. And they kept clean. They would clean them. They would make the attempt to clean them within 24 hours, take the car out of service, clean it up, put it back in. And they got to the point where they got so good at it that, you know, the graffiti artists kind of gave up. So that was a good policy that would be based on, more on, on the kind of the broken windows idea. So that's what we're talking about with policy implications. You know, Chicago area project, very similar to some things that exist in Philadelphia and other areas today. Mobilization for youth, you know, more finding, finding things for kids to do, positive things, positive opportunities, 
war and poverty, something been going on in this country since the sixties is basically trying to get people in a better, a better place in life, uh, taking better care of their communities, maybe more uh, housing grants, public housing, ways to get people, you know, living in a better situation, which is all social kind of social structure kind of stuff. So again, we talked about it already. I went through it. Chicago area project was during the thirties. Now think about it. They did this project in the thirties. And as I said, one of the things they were doing is improving physical appearance of poor neighborhoods. We're still trying to do that today. Does that mean it doesn't work? Or does that mean that, you know, it's one of these ideas that somebody said, Oh yeah, it's a great idea. Let's do it. And then they don't, they don't follow up and maintain it and things back fall back at wayside again. And it gets bad. An example might be, you know, in Philadelphia, you have the, uh, the Philadelphia Horticultural Society that is doing these pop-up gardens all over the city. And you take the, the nice greenery aspect and the pop-up gardens and people growing their own food and all that kind of cool stuff. And you, you also partner that with, we're going to take over some of these vacant lots that exist in town in the city that might be covered, you know, littered with trash and garbage and who knows what. And, and make it better. You know, po policy might be that whether it's a, a non-governmental agency like the Horticultural Society that's going in and planting planting gardens. Of course, before they plant the garden, somebody's got to go in and clean it up. So it might be a city-sponsored or a, a, a non-profit-sponsored event to go around and clean these cities. I know Philadelphia had one, whether it was April or May, I'm not sure, but there was a cleanup day. And a lot of communities do this. You got a cleanup day, and you get people, it might be sponsored by some, you know, larger companies that are working in the city that want to help the city, sponsored by the city itself. You know, they make cool t-shirts for the kids and, and the adults participating in the program. You have the, the uh, provision of equipment, trash bags, whatever you need to get the job done. And then you, you go in your own local community, and whether it's sweeping the sidewalks, sweeping the streets, cleaning the area around, you know, the abandoned or vacant property, property that looks really nasty, cleaning the vacant lots, you know, doing all the things that try to make that community better. So that was what was done as part of the Chicago area project. It's what being, what's being done routinely in places like Philadelphia today. The whole idea is to take the ideas or take the knowledge that we have from these theories and translate it into a working policy or a, a program that's going to help take away the problems that we've identified, the social structure issues, and make things better. But then the next step to that is once we take them away, we have to make sure we maintain the good and not let the bad creep back into it. You know, take a look at this whole idea of, of that uh, area near the trains in Kensington where you have that nice little valley that's full of, of, of tents and, and people living there and shooting up on a daily basis and needles all over the place. And it was so bad that even the local park that's around the, the library uh, branch that's over there was, was littered with, with needles. Now you have the city going in and cleaning it up. You have uh, more police presence in the area. You have an agreement now between uh, Conrail that owns the area the, the ground around the trains and the city to go in and clean this, this area up and then maybe close it off with fencing or walls or something. And that's all well and good from a social structure perspective, partnering together between Conrail and the city and the people within a community to go in and clean up this mess. But how do we maintain it? Now at some point there's, we have to do something to maintain it. You know, these people who were shooting up drugs in that area were drawn to that area and because of the prevalence of drugs in that area. You got the sales. So that's another thing that has to be dealt with. You know, we've been fighting drugs for forever, it seems like, in this country. You know, the so-called war on drugs from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and, and on into where we are today, still going on. You know, if we could stop the flow or, or discourage people from using them, then we wouldn't have these places popping up. But that's still, I believe, a long way off. You know, how do we really address that problem? New Jersey just come up, came out with a new program called Reach NJ, which is trying to address the uh, the drug epidemic uh, in our state. But it's a big deal. 
And all these things are kind of tied together from a social structure aspect is getting it clean, getting it cleaned up and looking nice, providing more opportunity for the people within the community. But then there's that maintenance issue. And if you look up broken windows, or if you remember from the policing class, uh, and if you don't look it up, uh, crime prevention through environmental design, one of the big things, and this ties into broken windows for maintaining the area so there's not crime, is maintenance. Is you know cleaning up, cleaning off the graffiti, fixing the broken windows, fixing the sidewalk when it's messed up, cleaning the streets. All those things are part of policy initiatives and policy efforts that are gonna, gonna use ideas that we got from so social structure theories to, to work towards it. Uh, these are the objectives. We talked about these already in the Chicago area project, physical appearance, uh, recreational opportunities for youth. That might be after school programming, summer programming. Think about it now, all the kids are out in the street. Now, if they're parents, you know, parents are still working. You know, parents don't get to take off the entire summer unless their their teachers are in some profession that allows them to do that. So now you have have kids on the street. You know, younger kids might be still going to daycare, but older kids, adolescents, and teenagers, where are they? What are they doing? You know, providing recreational opportunities for them to be involved in stuff. Uh, in the city, you have obviously you have the different uh, playground initiatives, camp groups, the pools things going on at the, at the public libraries, but all these things have to be maintained and all these things cost money. When you start closing libraries as they did in the city of Philadelphia over the last many years, and you, you, you can't afford to open the pools or maintain the pools, then you have a problem developing within the community. And I know our current mayor, Mayor Kenny, is working on these issues. It's one of his initiatives, because it is very important to have these recreational opportunities. Chicago Area Project did it, and we're doing it here. Involve project members directly in the lives of troubled youth. So in the Chicago area project, you had adults and, and older teenagers involved who could be role models, models. You might have a mentoring program, you know, somebody who could work with the, ch work with the child, you know, give them ideas on what would be a positive uh, lifestyle and giving them a positive role model. You know, somebody who might be successful, somebody who, who they can talk to and look at and say, okay, you know, I want to be like, like Mr. Plunkett, or I want to be like Mr. Lynch, or I want to be like whomever, you know, uh, Mr. Lawson, because he's a good guy and he's successful and he worked hard to get where he is. And maybe I can follow in his footsteps. So they don't mention the other two projects, but in your book, I, like I said, the war on poverty was not necessarily a project. There's like hundreds and hundreds of projects if you look at the war on poverty, things that have been done in communities around the entire country over the years. All right, so a chapter summary. And this is just an over quick overview of, of everything that we've done so far in, the, in these past five videos. So we have three major approaches to crime causation that come from sociological perspectives. Social structure theories, which were the bulk of what we talked about this week, social process theories, and social conflict approaches. The social process theories, talking about how the different groups and, and organizations interact, and the social conflict approaches, where you have conflict between groups, are going to be the subject of next week's material, and probably about five different videos, because we're actually covering two different chapters. So those are the, the, the three basic prongs that we're looking at in sociological perspectives. Uh, social structure approaches emphasize the role of poverty, lack of education, absence of marketable skills, subcultural values, all as fundamental causes of crime. So what do we mean by marketable skills? Well, what can you do? You know, what kind of education do you have? What kind of job can you get with that education? Are you able to work with your hands and do something in a trade? Can you be a plumber, a carpenter? You know, there's a variety, electrician, all those things are needed. But if they don't, if you don't have the skills, you can't get those jobs. So social structure approaches look at the fact that some people don't have those. And when they don't have the marketable skills, they don't have the education and they're still in poverty. Maybe they choose an illegitimate way to get to what they need. Three major types of social structure theories that we covered this week. Social disorganization. 
strain theory and culture conflict. Strain theory looks at delinquency as a form of adaptive problem solving behavior. Culture conflict perspectives rely on the proposition that the root cause of crime is a clash of values in the, in the community. Uh, theoretical approaches that fault social structure as the root cause of crime point in the direction of social action as a solution. So, you know, we were just talking about the policy implications. When you say the social structure is the problem, well, the answer is going to be taking some kind of social action to fix those structural issues. You know, whether it's, you think about your, your clothes, because one of, the, one, of the, one of the questions or one of the, the lecture material talks about the fabric of society. Well, think about the clothes. You know, your rundown community might be your worst pair of jeans with all the holes in them, they're falling apart. And, you know, what do you do? Do you fix them or do you replace them? Social structure, you know, we're talking about fixing or replacing the parts of our society that are falling apart and therefore contributing to crime. So, yeah, that's, that's the end of this last uh, lecture number five. I would suggest that when you're done the lecture and you've reviewed the chapter, that you, you go into the end of the chapter in whichever book that you have. At the end of the chapter, there are, there's a case study on a, a person by the name of Sanika Shakur whose uh, alias was Monster Cody Scott. So read about, about him and his background. See if you can figure out you know, what, what are the structural issues that we talked about is, is responsible for his winding up in prison and the things that he did. Or you might look at him and say, well, maybe it's not the structural issues. You know, If you're a classical person and you believe that everybody makes their choice regardless of all the stuff going on in their lives, you might say, well, you know what? He, he might have grown up in that bad neighborhood, but he chose to kill people or whatever it was that he did. And then turn to the next page, and you have, in, in both editions of the book, a whole bunch of, of questions. Uh, you have each learning outcome that is part of this, uh, this chapter is listed separately and, and within each learning act outcome are, are questions. And some of these questions are where the, the questions in your homework assignment came from or questions in some of the discussions. So you look at, at all of the learning outcomes that are listed and in, in the third edition, it lists six learning outcomes. In the second edition, it only lists five. So in the second edition, the sixth one is, is weaved into one of the others. But if you look through, it, it gives you definitions of the different titles. It talks about the key, the key players, the key theorists, and, and explains what their theories were. So this last, the last two pages in this chapter basically break it all down for you. So it's, it's very valuable to go look at these, look at the questions, look at the, the brief overview they give you for the, that learning outcome, and look at the definitions that they give you, and also look at the, the people and the explanations of how, what their involvement was in these various theories. And then, of course, once you're done all that, then you can jump into your assignment for this week and figure out which of the, which of the seven questions that you want to answer, all of which I believe appear in these last two pages. So I would do that first. Go through, after going through the chapter, read through those, those last two pages, you know, think about those questions in your mind before you go into the actual questions. You should also be, you know, since it's, it's already Friday, actively participation, participating in discussions so you can get those, those, that major response that you got to do, and then also that reply to that one other student that you have to do uh, to, to complete that particular assignment successfully. Those of you who are wondering about your projects, I am, it's on my agenda to do tonight and or tomorrow morning when it's pouring rain in the area uh, so that you can get some feedback on that project draft. The grade, I wouldn't worry so much about the grade. Usually if, if you did the, the draft and it's a decent draft and you didn't just like throw me some crap, you're gonna get the full grade for the draft. Where I'm gonna get critical 
is after I give you the draft back with my recommendations of how to improve this draft and turn it into a good project, then when I get the final project, which is due on July 3rd, I'll be looking at those with a more critical eye. And that's where you can expect you know, actual grading to occur depending upon how well that you do on that project. So I'm gonna to try to get those back to you this weekend whether it be tonight or tomorrow, you know, obviously it's one at a time. So some people get it. Somebody might get it this afternoon and somebody might not get it till tomorrow afternoon, depending on how long it, I, I have 12 of, the, 12 of them in the bin that I have to look through and uh, get them back to you as quickly as possible. So hopefully everybody's doing well. Oh, wow. It's six after six. I got to go catch the action news. Everybody have a wonderful evening.